there's something also happening in the chat a little bit in regard to like our positions. I mean, it is hard when we're talking about hierarchy and we're in a, yeah. what people are like, this is a hierarchical system. It's like people are kind of trying, I mean, it's hard to make change when people are like, this is just how academia is. Uh -huh. And I'm a lecturer. I actually have more job security now because of retirements in my department than I've ever had since COVID started. I've I've been in the community college system in California before COVID started. You know, I have taught on three different campus campuses. I would drive to reservation land to uh, teach on one remote campus in Northern, Northern California. You know, I was on so many, I would be on three campuses simultaneously and barely making ends meet and working as a gig worker, as a studio assistant, I would write, I would copy edit in my free time. I did all this stuff. I mean, these are a lot of the things that people are carrying just to get by. And that's what faculty really look like, you know? And it's really hard to get people to like recognize that like we all have to stand together if we're gonna make any kind of change at all when people yeah. are like but also if i speak up i might not even have a job next semester and that means i'm not going to have health care and how do i even see myself as part of this whole when i'm just teaching one class i don't have an office i don't even interact with any other faculty so i think it's really tough that we're yeah i mean our identities are are definitely shaping the way that we participate with one another but our positions within the institution they do vary and our our the precarity that we experience as lecturers is really intense and scary and you know i was going to take a pay cut until the week before the semester started and i picked up another class you know and just the workloads that we have to carry to make it through is really tough so trying to organize people when they are not seeing themselves all on the exact same in the exact same position where they may experience a little bit more privilege in their position than others and then lecturers who are just so desperate like honestly like desperate <laughs> and scared and trying to get people to organize when they believe that they can't you know uh, th they're having a hard time really understanding like their connection to the whole I mean, lecture um, precarity yeah. is real, but I just want to respond to some of the stuff in, in the chat because it is just a fact that blackness is consistently a state of precarity. Uh -huh. And I am a full and tenured professor who sued my department academically, did an academic grievance against them as a graduate student. So never ever have I played it safe as a graduate student, as an untenured assistant, or nor now. But I think it's got to be understood. When I've got friends who tell me that when they arrive on campus, they're told, avoid that Sharon Elise. She's a troublemaker. Don't work with her. And I hear this consistently over and over throughout my career. There is something about being both Black, um, unapologetic, and outspoken because I'm not supposed to speak these things that leaves me in a permanent position of precarity. And so maybe you understand a little bit of that as a lecturer, but understand this precarity is lifelong. It's lifelong. And as as AMB, if you excuse me saying that you can go there earlier, as AMB was saying earlier, how many fucking lifetimes will it take? Yeah, until my precarity is over. Right? right? That is something I feel. And I feel it and understand this. I feel it for my granddaughters. I right. feel it for my relatives in Kansas City and my relatives in Mississippi. They have no way out, okay? So we have to understand this shit is real and white supremacy is real and our precarity right. is different from yours. We have to get well, that. Something I'm really in, I mean, I don't know how this feels for you all. I and I can't track chats whenever I do events. I just like I keep the chat off. So I'm like, y'all are responding to something. I'm not sure what. And what I'm interested in is this is exactly why y'all are fascinating to me <laughs> because I'm like the levels of different positions, positionality, the different privileges, the honesty you have to have about where you sit inside of them. The you you know it's like 
there's what we can see of each other and what that shapes in the lifetimes that we get to have. And then there's what we're doing and what we're experiencing and all the things we can't see. And I love, I'm just like, oh, wow, <laughs> y'all just bring it. Okay. Y'all are just in here. So I'm really grateful for that. And, you know, Sharon, I think what you're speaking about, like what I hear in this is like the truth of the academy is that it is a system that was designed by oppressors to uplift oppressors and to uplift the history and the, the way that oppressors wanted us to see the world. That's the system. And then anyone who's coming into that system, even if you have a different mindset or different approach or whatever, you're still in some way, you're like chipping away at a really massive ideology that is, I think of a, as a sociopathy, right? I'm like, this that is not logical. There's no truth to it. There's no actual supremacy amongst human beings. We're all a mess. We all poop. We all do the same thing. But we've been told that some of us are more valuable than others and it has lived into us. And, you know, part of why I chose to do all my work outside of the academy is because I was like, I'm not doing that shit. <laughs> I'm never, you know, I'm, I'm talking, I'm supporting two different friends who are trying to get their first books published right now. And they're going through academic presses. And I'm like, are you kidding me? People you don't even know get to read your stuff and tell you it's crap. And you have to take that, you know, like, I'm just like, no, <laughs> you know, so I'm, I'm too weak for the Academy perhaps, but I'm out here doing my thing. And I'm looking at what y'all are doing. And I'm like, you are trying to change something that does not want to be changed. That um, is going to push back at you and benefits every time you turn against each other, right? So that's the ultimate, you know, that's the ultimate uphill battle when you're in a war, right? When you And we are always at war in this nation. When you're in that war, the uphill battle is in order to win, we have to form coalitions that are uncomfortable and those coalitions have to be honest. And then we have to recognize that at all times, the most dangerous thing that can happen is for us to be rendered apart, right? And the rending apart makes sense because we are still dealing with each other. It's like, it's fascinating and it feels like it's all alive inside of the space that you are in. And I don't really have a question around it. I mostly want to just say an affirmation uh, around it, right? That it's like somehow you persist and it's a one step at a time persistence. And I feel like this past year has been that it's like, as a species, are we here? Are we willing to get compatible with the planet? how are we going to work with each other to do that? And I see that in you I just want to reflect. I'm like, go off CFA. <laughs> I, you know, I'm impressed. And could I say something too about uh, sure. the chat regarding, with the exception of Nicola, all of the speakers are tenured uh, full professors. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. it's something, like, that's what's happening in the chat. <laughs> yeah, it's something that we, you know, we didn't think about. We make mistakes, we still grow. We thought it was, you know, we were primarily in planning this, you know, we wanted certainly to have officers presenting or, or having a conversation with you. Uh, but I'm glad that I saw that in chat because we constantly need to be told how we can be better. Uh, and we're human and we make mistakes. But when we hear from folks, we try to be corrective the next time around. <laughs> I want to throw that out there. Okay, that's good. That's helpful to know. Yeah, I can add, I wanted to say something about that, and that is that all of our um, anti-racism, social justice work, our transformation requires humility. It requires us to step, to take what Charles says, that step back and say, you know what? Yeah, I could be better. I'll work on that next time. Um, I think it requires, even in this, this moment of this conversation, this is so real, like there's a little bit of discomfort here. There's a hint of defensiveness and all that, but I'm thankful for people who bring it um, and help us to make those adjustments. Because the one thing I know about those folks is I love them because they're fighters, right? And that's what we need. We need fighters. We need people who understand the pressures and the tensions and stay the course. Um, and we got to stay the course with each other because our interconnectedness, along with all of our divisions, it's not hard to, to, to come together and to, I mean, it is hard to come together and to appreciate um, our differences and our intersectionalities. Yeah. So I think, um, I'm sorry if I disrupted the convo here. It was good. Um, 
No, but I think it's helpful because I'm like, you know, I'm like, y'all are, y'all are a living entity. Yeah. So what's some advice? <laughs> I mean, you know, we, we're, we're muddling our way through uh, all of this. What's some advice? Well, I mean, one thing is to celebrate how far you have come, you know, celebrate, just be able to look at each other with some dignity because that's what it is. I think of it, you know, people, we're talking about reparations and um, and we talk about it usually in a financial sense. But for me, I think about it in a spiritual and a dignity sense. You know, I, I think of it as this um, inch that black people are expected to cow, you know, that it's, we're expected to like drop in, or, you know, like we're, if you are a woman, if you, if you come from it, oppressed peoples, the idea is that you're supposed to shrink a little bit in some way. And it, that shrinking is what will make everyone feel okay and feel superior and feel powerful, whatever. And so to me, there's a redistribution of that inch, that power that, that there, I'm not better than you, I'm not worse than you, we're in this. And so one thing is to just acknowledge, and I think that you're doing that. I think a second piece that I, you know, I keep talking to organizations about this, but develop the internal capacity for mediation. So it's like on one hand, you wanna develop that capacity for being a truth teller or being a disruptor, being someone who moves into the system. But if everyone is doing that move and no one is actually training up as the mediators, um, then you end up with a bunch of people who are making excellent points at each other, but there's no one who's weaving it together, figuring out the outlets. And I don't think that that's something like, and I say this as someone who's often like very special or, you know, Adrian Marie Brown, you know, but I think it actually shouldn't be a specialized thing. You know, one of the reasons that I'm stepped back from facilitating right now is because I'm like, I've done enough and I've taken up enough space in that field and I want to just train other people up now. So like I run facilitation trainings, I run mediation trainings, but I'm like, uh, everyone needs to know how to do this. And you can learn, you can pick up a book, you can read that book, you can integrate what you know. I put what I know about it in some books. There's a lot of other books, right? There's so many ways to access the skill set, and it's something to practice often, right? So when I see people in conflict, especially in my friend group or in organizations I care about, I'm like, let me talk, let me talk to you. And if I can support, let me support this. And I want to see so many people learn to do that, right? That it's like there's facilitation, but then there's particularly like, well, how do we hold this conflict and how do we hold it in a way that um, takes accountability, allows accountability to be taken and how do we hold it in a way that's honest and how do we hold it in a way that's humble? But one of the biggest things for me is that staying humble even as we do good work because there's a way, you know, I think this is one of the things I always laugh at with like diversity, equity and inclusion work is people are like, well, we're diverse now or whatever. And it's like, that was like the baby step, you know, <laughs> like, and then, and then, and then there's the step of like being together, which we've been conditioned not to be. And then there's so many other steps. Um, I think another big piece, you know, in some ways, like we started off and it was like, we have this land acknowledgement moment. I think I want to see more and more spaces also have a vision acknowledgement moment, right? It's like the land is what holds us and where we come from. And then where is it we're going? And, and are we, let's remember, let's like acknowledge and remember that we are people on purpose and there's something larger than ourselves that we're trying to attend to. And um, in uh, We Will Not Cancel Us, I speak about principled struggle in holding change. I spell, spell it out more, but a huge piece of principled struggle, like the only way you can actually be principled in struggle is if you have a sense that there is something larger than yourselves that you are actually trying to build towards or move towards. If you don't have that shared sense of vision, it's actually really hard to resolve conflict because it's like, we're literally trying to go two different ways, baby. <laughs> if I'm not trying to go, you know, and I always tell people this, I'm like, like, no, you know, this is, I've been offered some facilitation gigs that you wouldn't believe, you know, people are like, we're going to pay you gazillions of dollars to come do this. I'm like, but because you're heading in such a different direction than I am, I can't take this job because I, I'm good at what I do. And so you'll be better at what you do when I leave. And I don't want you to be better at what you do because you're literally trying to destroy the planet <laughs> or you're literally trying to like, you know, uphold power in some way. For me, it was like, 
there's no principle there. I can't be principled with you, you know? So I feel like that vision acknowledgement allows us to say, we're both trying to go this way. Now we may fight the whole way, right? Some relationships, that's how the passion shows up, you know? It's like, hey, <laughs> you're getting on my fucking nerves, <laughs> right? I love you, right? And like, you just have to let the dynamic emerge. But I feel like that's some of the stuff, you know, mm, I also think, you know, I wrote We Will Not Cancel Us. And I want to say that we're in this moment right now where like the urge is to be like, you are bad, you're 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 out of here. And the move that I keep trying to figure out in myself and in, in the movements I'm supporting is how can we, how can we stop the hierarchy, right? How can we check the hierarchy? How can we notice the hierarchy out loud to each other and be like, oh, <laughs> there's a part of me that feels superior to you and here's why. And can I notice it? And can I examine it a little bit, right? Because that's what's coming out when we're saying you deserve to be canceled. It's like, you're worse than me. Now, there are people who do egregious harm. I just celebrated when Mute, Mute R. Kelly, you know, all of that was successful and that R. Kelly is actually gonna be held accountable. I'm like, that is someone who had so much power and who no other intervention was able to stop. And so this is a blessing. And it's a blessing for those girls. It's a blessing for those families. It's a blessing for his ass. <laughs> he doesn't know it yet, but like whatever karma he is constructing in his lifetime, this running up against this wall is a blessing for him. But for most of us, that's not the level of harm that we're dealing with. We're, we're dealing with something imbalanced, you know, some places where we're kind of messed up, some places where we show up. And so in that way, it's like, oh, how can I be in right relationship with other people? How can I name boundaries where I need boundaries? How can I name critiques where I have critiques? How can I notice if I'm even in a relationship where that critique matters, right? And it feels like this is what y'all are up to already. So I hope I'm not covering the territory already, but just continually inviting you to, to notice. It's like, if this is a relationship, do the hard work of being in conflict with each other, right? Um, versus what I think is the easier work of saying, let's just get rid of them right? Um, let's just get rid of them. To me, that disposability is at the heart of Western culture. It's at the heart of the thing we're trying to decolonize from, that there's something you can throw people away towards, or there's people who are disposable and you could just work them to death or whatever it is, that prison industrial complex, that way of moving, it's all connected, right? And the opposite way, which I've heard y'all espouse, of that we are all connected right? Doesn't allow for that disposability. 